Suki Hotu to all brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. What you're seeing in the background is actually the shrine. It's a Buddha, a Sri Lankan style Buddha that has been carved out of marble in Myanmar, in Burma, by a Taiwanese sculptor. <laughs> so, and behind the Buddha, you see the, the five colored aura of the Buddha. So first of all, I will begin with defining what aloka means. The word aloka means light. It refers to the light of wisdom. The Buddha, in the first sermon, the Dhamma Chakka Pavatana Sutta, the Buddha explained about his enlightenment, the experience of his enlightenment. And he said in these words, Chakkung Udapadi, Nyanang Udapadi, Panya Udapadi, Vijja Udapadi, Aloko Udapadi. Aloko Udapadi. That is where we derive this word Aloka. The Buddha's experience of enlightenment. When he said Chakkung Udapadi, when the eye of wisdom arose in him, then he goes on to say, Jnana the Padi, Panya the Padi, Vijja the Padi. These are the different degrees, different aspects of wisdom and insights. And finally, the Aloko the Padi, the light arose. So aloka stupa, aloka stupa refers to that light of wisdom that has been experienced, that's experienced at the time of the Buddha's enlightenment. Now, what is the meaning of the term symbol? The word symbol is actually something which represents something else. Some material object which represents something abstract. Like, for example, the stupa representing enlightenment of the Buddha. Yeah? Now, it's very important to understand what symbols are. And uh, the language which we write, we use uh, letters of the alphabet. They are symbols. The numbers, the figures that we count in mathematics, they are also symbols. And Symbols mean different things to different people. If you ask the question, what does 9-11 mean to an American? An American will say it's a disaster. It's the collapse of the Twin Towers in New York on the 11th of September. But if you ask a mathematician, what does 9-11 mean? He would say, it is just two odd numbers. Yeah. And similarly, if we say 9 to 5, what does 9 to 5 mean to an office worker? It means they have to work from 9 a.m. to 9, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. But what does 9 to 5 means 
for a timekeeper, somebody who keeps time, he will say, it is 9 to 5 means 9.25 a.m. So you see these are different interpretations to symbols. So that is why it's important to have the right idea, yeah, what symbol means. Another thing is it's important for you to note when we meditate, we will at some point in our meditation, we begin to see mental images. These are called nimittas. And a very common nimitta, of course, is the light nimitta. When you develop mindfulness and breathing in and breathing out, then your concentration develops, then some light may appear. It is the Patibhaga nimitta. So that nimitta, that symbol of light, like tells us, inform us that our mind has approached to a certain degree of purity. Yeah. And uh, like that, there are other symbols. Symbols like stupas, Buddha images, lotus flowers, light, so on. And uh, they are all, these are all very positive symbols. They are signs that to show us that our mind approaching to purity. In fact, during my travels in America with my lay teacher, we met one Christian pastor. He approached my teacher and asked him, about meditation experience. And he's a Christian pastor. He said during his meditation, he sees lotus, lotus flower. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what religion, what you profess. When your mind reaches to a certain state, then certain limiters, some impression that has been made in you for a long time, that impression will come out as symbols. Yeah. This is why in our daily devotion or chanting, we always remind ourselves of the three main objects of veneration. When we recite Vandami, Chetiam, Sabatani, Supatititang, and so on, we are actually recalling to mind the objects of veneration. All the shrines, including the stupa, which contains or which, which enshrines the relics of the Buddha. Then the Bodhi tree. The Bodhi tree is also an important symbol. And Buddha images, they are symbols of perfect enlightenment, which many people do not understand. When people look at the images, Buddha image, they think we are idol worshippers, that we are worshipping the, what you call images. Actually, by looking again and again, this image of the Buddha, it reminds us of the enlightenment of the Buddha and all the great qualities of the Buddha. So when that is impressed in our consciousness, these objects, these symbols will keep on appearing in our lives. And it will appear in our dreams. I'm sure you all have experienced sometimes in your dream, you see, they are mental images. And you see something, it be, become very frightened. On the other hand, there are some images, mental images, some symbols that appears. You'll be very happy and peaceful. Now, this also happened during the final moments of our life. 
And uh, I remember my teacher mentioned how three things take place towards the end of our life, the last moments of our life. First, there is the manifestation of karma in terms of our thoughts. All sorts of thoughts arises, good and bad thoughts. Then, one of those thoughts that is strongly impressed in our mind, whether good or bad thought, that thought manifests into an image, into a symbol. And, and that is why some people see in the, the last moments of their life, they can see some good symbols, spiritual, religious symbols, and they feel very peaceful. Others see some symbols, they remind them of their, the wrong actions that they do, they can be very fearful and suffering. And uh, so, there is a story how during the time of the Buddha, the story of uh, Chunda, the butcher. Once the Buddha was preaching, and while the Buddha was preaching, Venerable Ananda, who was the most faithful disciple of the Buddha, Venerable Ananda heard some noise, some screaming noise, coming from a house, a cottage nearby. So Venerable Ananda waited until the Buddha finished his sermon. Then after that, Ananda asked the Buddha that, what is that noise? Did he hear that noise coming from a house nearby? And when the Buddha directed his mind to that place, immediately the Buddha knew what was happening. Buddha had that ability. Buddha saw. And then Buddha explained that that screaming sound, it's actually a squealing sound, actually came from Chunda. And Chunda was a butcher. He was dying. And his last moments, towards his last moment, he saw a dagger. The dagger which he used to kill the pigs. And upon seeing this symbol, this mental image, he began to squeal like a pig and he fell down on the ground and started to roll on the ground like a pig. So Buddha explained, this is what the rebirth is actually taking. This is what you call bhava. Bhava means becoming, the process of becoming. Just before he takes, he dies and takes a birth. So that is why we tend to highlight the importance of performing merits, such as offering of lights, flowers, incense, and making connection with the Sangha. And especially if you have opportunity to participate in novitiate programs, meditation retreats, and so on. Because all these activities will create a kind of good memory. And it will strongly impress in your consciousness so that at given time, certain occasion, some positive mental images and symbols will arise and it will condition peaceful and uh, what you call good rebirth. I remember in Sri Lanka, I think it's in Polonnaruwa, the king at that time was Nisankamala and he made sure that his minister would engrave all his good deeds 
onto a granite rock. You can still see it after today, yeah. And uh, and he said that his minister he gave instruction that his minister should read out all these merits, all the good things which he has done before he passed away. Yeah. But no bad things is to be recorded. <laughs> Only the good things. Yeah. So that will condition. Good thoughts and the good thoughts will give rise to good rebirth. Yeah. So now, <clears throat> so much about symbols and what they mean and how important it is for us and to have the right association of thoughts. Yeah. So what does aloka stupa mean to you? Now, before you think of answer. Uh, let me explain this. Yeah, we say that aloka stupa is a symbol of enlightenment. Why? And uh, I will read to you uh, the explanation I got from the uh, Oxford Dictionary. Yeah, and uh, it's through the internet. It says that uh, a stupa is a mound-like or hemispherical structure containing relics that is used as a place of meditation. Yeah. And what does it symbolize? The stupa itself is a symbol of the Buddha and more accurately of his enlightened mind and presence. So this is what Oxford Dictionary say, yeah. Now I am quite sure. Twenty, thirty years ago, you won't find this definition, and this show clearly the influence of Buddhism, even in the language that we are using today, yeah, the English language, yeah. For Buddhists. There is no architectural form that is more important than a stupa. So it is just it is more than a structure. It is actually a lesson in Buddhism. Yeah. Now different stupas have different designs, and uh, there are different structures or component parts, and. Uh, they may mean different things. Yeah. The Aloka Stupa is designed according to the ancient Stupa of Sri Lanka in Anuradhapura. It is called Tuparama. It was built during the time of Arhat Mahinda and uh, King Devanampiyatissa around 220 BC and it, <clears throat> it was actually it is believed to be on the very spot where the Buddha preached the Dhamma on his third and last and final visit to Sri Lanka. Yeah. Now we chose Tuparama because that was the place where we meditated most of the time during our pilgrimages to Anuradhapura. And it was there that we received lots of inspiration. When we were on a retreat and uh, with a group of uh, nuns, and when we were meditating together at Tuparama. And that was where for the first time I heard our teacher, our meditation teacher, preaching to the devas. Yeah. And uh, at first I did not know what he was doing because I knew that he was not talking to us. Then later he said, can't you see them? 
they are all there in the sky in these things and i say no i can't see <laughs> but there were a number of the other nuns who had developed their mind who had a clairvoyance and they could see how the devas some were in a clusters of them and they all were looking very proud and uh, so what our meditation teacher preached to them and say that they should not think that they are in, they are permanent that they are also subject to death impermanence subject to change when the karma ripens then they were fall back so that is how i had my first uh, what you call uh, first hand experience with uh, somebody preaching to devas yeah although i have heard about devas we all have heard about devas nagas and all the celestial beings but because we cannot see them so we don't quite believe it yeah and uh, but i will tell you that the stupa and uh, has taught us a number of lessons yeah. so that is why we chose aloka stupa but uh, according although the shape of aloka stupa looks like tupa rama aloka stupa is unique in its own way because it is not solid tupa rama is a solid there's no hole inside in our case we have a hall and there are three doors yeah now i will explain to you <clears throat> i will show you the diagram we'll have a look at the diagram of the stupa and then i will explain to you the different uh, component parts of the stupa yeah okay put on the diagram <clears throat> the in sri lanka stupas are generally uh, divided into three parts seal the base is seal the dome shape that samadhi and then the other parts and uh, above the dome onwards to the pinnacle that represents a wisdom part seal samadhi anya this is the path to enlightenment in fact this is the path to put an end to all sufferings to put an end to old age sickness and death now first of all we had the the bottom the base sila aloka stupa has got five steps if you observe the diagram show only three but there should be five steps the five steps and the staircase represent the five precepts observing the five precepts basic precept is the foundation of the development and purification of the mind yeah now Originally stupas were built in the middle of a crossroad where the sangha from the four traditions from four directions will meet and congregate hence we have that's how we have four such staircases facing north south east and west yeah why because as i said and uh, you find the ancient stupas they usually built on a crossroad in the middle of a crossroad yeah and uh, so <coughs> and <coughs> the octagonal the platform that you walk on the octagonal platform with the asokan rail railings there are the eight spoke wheel symbols which represent the noble eightfold paths traditionally we would circumambulate or walk 
three rounds around the stupa in a clockwise direction with our right shoulder towards the stupa. And as we walk around, we will recall the virtues or the qualities of the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, such as Itipiso, Bhagava, Arahang, Samma, Sambuddho and so on. That's how we recall the virtues, the qualities of the Buddha. Then Swakato, Bhagavata, Dhammo, they are the virtues of the Sangha, the Dhamma. And then Supatipanno, Bhagavato, Sauga, Sango, they are virtuous qualities of the Sangha. And then you find at the base of the stupa, in the case of Aloka stupa, we have four platforms. And it is on those platforms that we place the light, the lamps, when people make offerings of light and we offer and we put around these four what you call platforms now these four platforms just before you enter the stupa that one we would uh, explain in terms of the four foundations of mindfulness mindfulness on the body mindfulness on feelings mindfulness on the mind and mindfulness on dhamma these four foundations of mindfulness yeah. Then when you walk around the stupa three times, it is as if that you are walking the Noble Eightfold Path. That means you are practicing, you're reminding yourself to walk the Noble Path, the Noble Eightfold Path, which helps to purify your thoughts, speech and body action. And that's what the three doors. In Aloka Stupa, we have three doors. The three doors represent thought, speech, body action. Body, speech, and mind. Yeah. So, as we circumambulate, circumambulate walk around the Stupa, and uh, we must remember cultivating, practicing the Noble Eightfold Path, the four foundations of mindfulness. And then we enter the shrine. And when you enter the shrine, you see the Buddha, like just now you saw. And uh, you see the Buddha, and you seek blessings, guidance, protection, so that you will be able to progress along the path to enlightenment. Now, inside the stupa is the main shrine, as I showed you just now. And uh, it, there's a marble statue of the Buddha, and behind the Buddha, you have the aura of the Buddha. Yeah? Now, as you meditate, what happens? Your mind starts to develop. Then you begin to ex experience a vast expanse of the mind. And that's where the dome shaped structure, and that represents the vast expand of mind. And usually when we talk about the mind, we tend to and uh, compare it to the vast open sky. Yeah? And uh, the mind is so vast yeah? and empty. Yeah? So you find that. And as you develop your samadhi concentration, your mind begins to develop and you experience this expanse, this vast expanse of mind. And what happened? And at some certain stage after you develop your mind, first, second, third, fourth jhana, then you begin to have insight on what? You begin to see the Four Noble Truth. You begin to see what suffering is about, the cause of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and the path, the way to end suffering. And that is why from this dome-shaped structure, on the top of it, on the roof of it, you find a square box. It's a box, square. And uh, that square box, it symbolizes the Four Noble Truths. 
And within that square box, you actually find louvers, glass louvers. And on the louvers, you will find the wheel symbol, the eight spoke wheel symbol. In other words, the noble eightfold path in the four noble truths. That is how the Buddha taught. When you see the four noble truths, you will also see the way what suffering is, Dukkha, the cause, Samudaya, Niroda, the cessation, and Magga, the path. And the path is actually the Noble Eightfold Path. So in the Four Noble Truth contains the Noble Eightfold Path. So when you start to see and realize what these Four Noble Truths are, this is what you begin to experience, the emptiness of the self. Yeah? Because the very first definition of the word Dukkha, of course, the Buddha explained in terms of uh, birth, old age, sickness, death, and so on. Buddha first explained Dukkha in terms of the physical condition due to the body. Birth, old age, sickness, death. Then the Buddha explained about the mind, the suffering that people experience through our mind. Then when we associate with people whom we don't like or conditions that are unpleasant, we experience Dukkha. Or sometimes we like some people and some, at some point or another, we have to be separated from our loved ones or pleasant conditions. That's also Dukkha. And we expect, we desire suffer something, we crave for something and we cannot get what we want then disappointment, they are also Dukkha. So that is the fundamental aspects of suffering. And then the Buddha actually summarizes the term Dukkha. In these terms, Buddha said, Sankitena Panchupadana Kanda Dukkha. That is, the five grasping aggregates are Dukkha. So this is what, when you realize, when you have the wisdom, you begin to see the true nature of yourself. And you see the emptiness of the self. And above that, what you call square box, you find a drum, yeah? And from the top, if you look from the top, it's actually a circular structure that represents emptiness. So when one realizes this emptiness, this is how transformation takes place. The transformation from a worldly being, Putujjana, into a noble one, Arya Puggala. Yeah? So after the transformation takes place, then the different stages of enlightenment, and then Above that drum, you find the spiraling cone and uh, there are seven, what you call rings around that cone. Yeah. And these are the seven factors of enlightenment, which leads to the final realization of Nibbana. And above that cone, you find the brass pinnacle. And that brass pinnacle represents the summary of the process of enlightenment. Yeah? And above the pinnacle, you find a crystal. And this crystal, crystals are used for the purpose of magnifying what you call energy vibration. So the pinnacle at the stupa it serves to radiate the light of wisdom to all around. And uh, so that is so much about this. And uh, the energies of the stupa, actually, is so important. And uh, because we have enshrined 
usually in stupas they enshrine relics of the Buddha. In our case, we have enshrined in Aloka stupa not only the relics of Buddha, but they are also the relics of Guru Rinpoche, the, of other enlightened masters and teachers from the different traditions. They are relics which received from India, from Sravasti, then from Sri Lanka, then from uh, uh, Burma, Thailand, and various parts. And we also receive from the Tibetan sites. Yeah. So we have all the different uh, practitioners and uh, at different stages of enlightenment where they left the, what you call relics, right? And uh, we managed to get and collect them. So that is what, why it is so precious, the yeah, Loka Stupa, yeah? Now, I will relate to you how the Dhamma unfold as we were building the Stupa. There were some kind of uh, mysteries, yeah? or unexplainable phenomena which accompanied during the time of construction. Yeah. And, uh, and this is something it is not, uh, it is not just for Aloka Stupa, but I have noticed this and I have heard also when other stupas are built, especially when stupas are built in some strategic positions, some strategic sites, then the, such phenomena take place. Now, before the construction, what happened before the construction? Actually, here in Australia, uh, most of the contractors do not know how to build this kind of intricate structures. And they prefer to build boxes, square boxes, yeah? And, uh, <clears throat> But when you have a dome and you have a square box and you have a, you know, all the different component parts and they do not know. So very difficult to find contractors. So what I did, I remember, I went to Kuan Yin Shrine. We have a small Kuan Yin Shrine, yeah? And I actually prayed to Kuan Yin Pusa and uh, to help us to find a contractor or somebody who can help us to build a stupa. And you won't believe, before I could finish sitting, I heard the phone ringing. And uh, because at that time I had uh, what you call, the, I was using uh, cordless mic, cordless uh, phone. So I put the cordless phone just outside the, what you call uh, the shrine. So when the phone rang, I got up and I took up the phone. And the phone says, and there was this man who said, I can build your stupa, I can build your stupa. <laughs> now, you know, this is something which, uh, you know, it's very difficult to explain. Yeah. So when this person say he can build a stupa, I got all his name and his phone number. But I could not convince our committee members because the committee member says that they need to have open tender. Yeah. To get different contractors and open tender. But somehow, after one by one going through the tender, finally, we came to this man. This man who called me over the phone and said that he can help to build our stupa. So that is how we managed to find somebody who could help us with that. Yeah. And then also we received messages how we should go to Tibet. We should go to 
Jokang Monastery and uh, the holiest or the holy place in Lhasa. And that we should make offerings. We should make various offerings there to seek blessings for the stupa. And we were told that it is there we will get some relics of the Buddha. And we were also told that the relics of the Buddha will come from Supur. Supur is actually the seat of Karmapa. Then, and truly when we went to Lhasa, we made all the offerings. Yeah? After offering the Kanjo, Tanjos and all the scriptures and uh, make various offerings. And then, at the end of it, the manager of the this Jokang Monastery and he knew, he, we told him that we came to make all these offerings for blessings to build a stupa. Then at the end of it, he just took something and uh, wrapped up in a newspaper, he put it in my hand. And he said, put this in the stupa. Then I say, what is this? He says, these are relics, rinsel. And they are from Supur. So these are exactly what the message that we receive. Yeah. Now, that is how this Aloka Stupa and uh, make through this Aloka Stupa, we made connections with various Tibetan centers, Tibetan masters and teachers. And uh, and we saw how they were so authentic, so what you call uh, magnanimous in offering because they have a living tradition of building stupas. And uh, so they were so happy that they were able to offer us some relics, yeah, whatever that they have. And uh, so that's how we went to Tsikim, we went to uh, Several times we went to Tibet, Samye, Katok Monastery, Payul, and all those. Then, in order to convince our young members, devotees, about what stupa is about, we did pilgrimages. We did pilgrimages to uh, Sri Lanka, showed them all the big stupas in Anuradhapura, then went to what you call uh, Bodhagaya and then took them to Burma, to Pagan, see so many stupas. And this is how education, this is how we educated our youth and our, what you call devotees, on the significance of stupa. Yeah? And uh, so when we were ready to build stupa, and that is how people, you know, donated from various places, from different parts of the world. But I will tell you one uh, instance. Yeah. And uh, when one woman heard that we are building this stupa, I received a call from her and she said, my mother left me some money in London. I have put the money in London and I would like to offer you this money for your stupa. Then I say, okay. But she says it's quite a large sum. It's about it's 27,000 pounds. Yeah. And uh, I say, oh, sadhu. Yeah. But it took me some time to realize whose money this was. This woman say it's actually the mother had left this money for her. But actually, do you know who this mother was? Her mother was the midwife who delivered me. Yeah. And uh, yes, that's right. So I was, it was, you may say it's coincidence. It cannot be mere coincidence. Yeah. So I truly rejoice and uh, the midwife who delivered me 
had deposited this money. And when the time came for us to build the stupa, the daughter had this thought to then donate all this money for the stupa. Yeah. So, all right. And uh, then, during the construction, during the construction, I'll tell you that our builder is still around, he's in his 80 years, 80 over years old. Yeah. He used to tell me that when he saw the design, he saw the architectural drawings, he actually did not know how to build. He did not know what to do. But he said, when he came to Aloka in the morning, in the early morning, suddenly he would get idea how to build. Yeah. And this thing happened again and again. Yeah. Then another phenomena took place when we were pouring concrete. When you're pouring concrete, a stupa, sometimes there will be rain, there will be storm, right? Dark clouds. But somehow, the area where the stupa is, there will be no rain. And it will be dry and sometimes just a little bit of drizzle. So even the contractors, even the project managers, they all were surprised to see this kind of phenomena. Yeah. And uh, of course, uh, after, after the construction, yeah, and when we were installing the pinnacle, the crystal, and this all this happened in the daylight. Yeah. People could see different what you call clouds formation. They can see lions in the form of worshipping this thing. Then they saw orbs, lights. All these things can be seen through the naked eye. The different colors, lights. Now what are all these phenomena? All these phenomena are actually the work and the manifestation of the devas. Devas, Nagas, and their other celestial beings. They include the Dhamma protectors. Yeah. And they are all drawn by the energies, by the vibrations of the stupa. Why? Because when we recite the qualities of the Buddha, we say Buddha was also Satta Deva Manusanam. Buddha was the teacher of gods and men. Satta Deva Manusanam. And how, why the Devas? come to worship the stupa because of the relics of the Buddha and other enlightened masters and teachers. Now, those of you who have heard the Mangala Sutta, in the Mangala Sutta, Mangala Sutta begins with whom? Who were the ones who requested the Buddha to preach? It was actually the Devas. Yeah. And uh, because people were praying to the devas for all sorts of blessings, but the devas themselves did not know what the highest blessings are. So that is how they sent a representative to see the Buddha, to inquire. And we are told that when this particular deva appeared, where the Buddha was in Sravasti, in Jetavana Monastery, then the whole place was illuminated. And it happened in the late hours of the night. Yeah. The whole place was illuminated. This is the light, the radiant light body. That's why we call Devas. Devas is actually referring to the radiant body. Yeah. Devia. And it's from this word, Devya, Devya, that's how you get divine. 
and it is from this word that the word dios and god came about and don't forget the buddha's advice to the first group of monks the mission the buddha advice was for them to go out for the welfare for the happiness of the many or a compassion for the world for the benefit for the welfare happiness of gods and men so that is why when we build to pass like this right and uh, we start to see we start to experience such phenomena in fact we built another identical stupa in mount kinabalu that is uh, one of the highest mountain in the southeast asia in sabah yeah and similar phenomena also took place yeah not the same but they are different because they are different beings there are different devas nagas and other beings there yeah but they all rejoiced they all participated in this yeah so now <clears throat> in the metta sutta metta sutta buddha mentioned the benefits is actually in the uh, metta metta nisangsa sutta where the buddha mentioned about the benefits of sutta of the what you call uh, practicing metta and one of the 11 benefits refers to that uh, you will be close and what you call devas will associate with you so why i'm saying this thing because at this point of time especially in a time of crisis and uh, you all need blessings guidance protection yeah so there are such beings and especially those beings who have the faith who have the deep respect for the buddha dhamma sangha that means they are already having right views yes samaditi devas yeah but there are also some other lower beings that can benefit from the vibrations from the pure vibrations of all the enlightened masters yeah so now i like to tell you about uh, uh, i will summarize that the stupa aloka stupa is actually built for what purpose yeah it is actually to remind us of the true purpose of our life what is the true purpose of our life the real purpose of our life is actually to gain liberation to gain enlightenment why all of us want to be happy we will pray and all sorts of things to do all sorts of things to get happiness everybody wants happiness but what is happiness what is it that gives us that happiness all our happiness are actually related to freedom when you are free to do what you like to do you feel happy but we must realize there is no real freedom if our mind is not free from greed from hatred from delusion and that is why if we really want the true happiness the lasting happiness then enlightenment we need to gain our liberation right so <clears throat> the more you connect 
yourself with the stupa you know all those people i know that uh, during this uh, our st- why we celebrate this anniversary of our stupa yeah and uh, it is actually to create that opportunities for people to connect with this stupa connecting with stupa means connecting with aloka stupa means what it is actually connecting with the buddha dhamma sangha connecting with the symbol of enlightenment i have been told how for the last one month yeah and uh, some people will come husband and wife will come here and they will work for 20 days out of one month of the 30 days they come to clean to clean the floor to clean the stupa and not only that the young ones also they come to help to clean the stupa now while cleaning while doing all these activities they may not know that they are actually making connection with the stupa yeah those people who have been donated yeah and towards the stupa they make like offerings then whenever they think of the stupa they feel happy yeah so that is why it is so important that you learn to make connection with stupa yeah and the stronger connection you make it will be the strong impression in your consciousness and that is why it will lead you from life to life until enlightenment is attained now i like to tell you a little story how the stupa got built yeah when i was studying in sri lanka that was way back in 1976 my first trip to sri lanka my teacher took me there with my parents my sister brother in law and a small group of devotees then we visited anuradhapura and it was there that i saw huge stupas and i was so impressed with the stupa yeah that was the first time in this lifetime then the following year when i was studying and uh, i was uh, asked to do an exhibition and uh, of the activities of our institute the institute which we started which my teacher started in sri lanka so the first thing that came to my mind was to have a symbol of the stupa and then to put all the photographs inside the stupa then what happened after my studies in sri lanka my teacher asked me to go to singapore so i was a resident monk there in the singapore buddhist mission and after a few months and we thought about organizing an exhibition and what do you think i think about i thought about the stupa <laughs> how to have an exhibition of stupa so i found out i contacted various monks and i found this sri lankan monk who could help me make stupa out of polystyrene yeah and you know this monk who helped to build this stupa he also built a real stupa in sri lanka <laughs> many years ago i realized that yeah now there was not the end of it then after singapore i came to australia again i thought how do we reach out the dhamma and how do we bring dhamma to others this thing so i thought of the exhibition yeah and we did exhibition in the sydney university yeah and what do you think i thought about 
the highlight of the stupa, highlight of the exhibition, stupa. So I try to find again from Sri Lankan devotees who can help me build a model of the stupa. This man is actually still alive. He is about 90 over years old. Yeah. And you know, he actually carved up from the polystyrene and made the stupa. Yeah. So how many times this image of the symbol of the stupa appeared in my mind in this lifetime? Yeah. It appeared again and again and again. This is what I want to explain to you. Yeah. And this man who did the, in, in Sydney, who did, when he came here, he saw the real stupa, he was so happy. Yeah. Yeah. So this is what I mean by making connections with objects of veneration, right? You do it again and again, again and again. Right. And then this Tupa will constantly remind you of your purpose in life. And what is your purpose? To gain liberation, to walk in the footsteps of the Buddha and all his great disciples, great and noble ones, Arahats and Bodhisattvas. Yeah. There are incredible stories how and how stupas how the relics multiply and how certain bodhisattvas their relics different colored five different colors appearing yeah there are very genuine relics but there are also fake ones just as you know you think so it is when you have the kind of real aspiration right then all the genuine things will come to you. So that is what, like, finally, I like to say to this, that like all the ancient stupas in India, in Sri Lanka and other parts of the world, the Aloka stupa actually serves to prolong the Buddha Sasana that is the dispensation of the Buddha. This sacred peace monument with all the relics will remain long after we have left this world. Yeah. So, the mission of Aloka Meditation Center is this. We say, to kindle the light of wisdom within, to walk the noble path, and to be of service to humanity. So well, that's all I have for you all on this occasion when we celebrate the uh, anniversary of the stupa. And please connect with us. And uh, now I shall invoke blessings and whatever your wish whatever aspirations that you have and uh, <clears throat> there's some uh, question yeah. Oh, yeah. so there is a request that we play because some people came late and they could not see so there's a request that we play the video again yeah so while playing the video, you'll be able to connect with the stupa and then you can see. That actually was taken uh, last year. Yeah. And uh, we had a novitiate program. And that is why you can see the ants walking there, red ants and white ants there <laughs> walking around. Yeah. And some of you were there. And uh, so you just connect with this thing. And uh, those of you who have not come and should come and visit at some point, and those of you who have visited should come again and again. So we'll play this thing, and after that, we will invoke blessings, okay? We will share merits after that, yeah? 
Let us play now. that you have generated by watching the video of the Aloka Stupa. You now bring your attention close to your hearts and observe the calm, the quietness within. For those of you who have come here just recall to mind as if you are in the stupa all the others can join us and remember that in this stupa we have enshrined the relics of the buddha relics of guru and poche and so many other enlightened masters and teachers Before them all, in the calmness, in the quietness of mind, you will spread out loving kindness and have the good wish that all beings be well and happy. 
in your wholesome state of mind, share the merits with all the Dharma protectors, all the guardian deities, guardian deities of this Jupa, the guardian deities of our Loka, guardian deities of the Srima body, traditional owners of this land, and the guardian deities of wherever you are in your locality. Please share this marriage with them all. That in so rejoicing with this marriage, may they continue to give blessings and protection to all. Let us also dedicate marriage for the spiritual well being and happiness of all our departed relatives, teachers, and friends, whoever that comes to your mind. that all those who have donated, who have made possible the construction of this Jupa, those who are no more, may they all rejoice in this marriage. We also share this marriage with all those who have contributed in various ways towards the construction and the maintenance of this Jupa through the offering of lies and making other offerings during this anniversary period. All the services that they have rendered, may they all be blessed with long, healthy and happy lives. With all your good thoughts and the merits that you have acquired, please make your wish, make your aspiration that all these merits will pave the way for you to have opportunities so that you'll be able to further develop and purify your minds. Purify your minds from the tendencies of grasping and various forms of clingings and attachments. From the tendencies of anger, of hatred and grudges and the tendencies of delusion cultivating the qualities of generosity, loving kindness and wisdom, so that you will have the purity of mind that will give you the strength to confront and overcome whatever difficulties, whatever obstacles that may arise in your lives. That you will grow in wisdom and compassion, be able to make good use of your lives, not only for your own happiness, but also for the welfare, for the happiness of the many. May all the merits pave the way for you to progress in your lives, in your studies, in your work, that you be able to fulfill your worldly duties and responsibilities, and at the earliest opportunity, may the seed of enlightenment be sown in your hearts, so that you will walk the noble paths and be free from all sufferings one day and also have the wisdom, the compassion to help others, whoever that comes by your way. Please make your wish and aspirations. Once again, at this time, think of the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, whatever immediate problems or obstacle that has arisen in your life, have faith, have confidence in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha that you will have the strength, you will have the courage and wisdom to overcome whatever problems that arises, bringing them into the path of your practice, so that you will swiftly develop your full potentials and accomplish whatever that you need to accomplish in this lifetime. Please make your wish, make your aspiration. Also think of those who are near and dear to you whom you wish to bring the Dhamma to as we invoke blessings of the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. Bhattu Sabha Mangalang Rakhandra Sabha Devata Sambhavuddhan vavena sadha soti bhavantute 
bhattu sabha mangalam rakhandu sabha devata sabha dhamma bhavena sada sutte bhavantu te bhattu sabha mangalam rakhandu sabha devata sabha sangha bhavena sada sutte bhavantu te akasata ca bhumatta deva naga mahidika punyantang namo ditva jirang rakhandu loka sasana Akasata ca bhumatta deva naga mahidika punyantang namo ditva jirang rakhandu desana Akasata ca bhumatta deva naga mahidika punyantang namo ditva jirang rakhandu mangparangti idang me nyati nang hotu sukita hontu nyatayo Idang me nyati nang hotu sukita hontu nyatayo Idang me nyati nang hotu sukita hontu nyatayo Abhivadana silesa nichang vadda pachayino Chataro dhamma vaddanti ayu vanno sukhaṁ vallāṁ Ayura rogya sampati ka sapna sapka sampati mevacha Atho nibbāna sampatti mināte samitato. Sāṁ.